All right, and now let's start. And what we're going to talk about today is review. I mean, it's it's hopefully review. It's stuff we talk about in college algebra. So it, it's stuff we talk about in trigonometry a little. So it's stuff that we ought to already know, but just in case anybody's a little rusty. We would like, or I, the royal we, I guess, I would like to talk about functions and function notation. Zoom's a little rusty, this delay we're getting where I write and then it takes a moment to show up should uh, stop happening as time passes. So something that I promised to uh, sort of spend a little time on yesterday and then I didn't was um, the question of what calculus is. I mean, you all have to take it for whatever reason, but I suspect that most people, if you stop them on the street and ask them, would know the word calculus. They'd think it's some kind of math, but they wouldn't be able to say what it does or what it's good for. So calculus is used to study functions um, in a particular way. So to talk about what calculus is and what calculus is good for, we should remind ourselves of what a function is. And abstractly, Oh no, you've all taken college algebra. Somebody define a function for me. <laughs> well, that's fine. It's um it's why we do review. <laughs> so abstractly, a function is just a rule. That takes inputs and assigns them to outputs. So an easy example of a function is something like the area of a circle function. This function can take, this function can take as its input the radius of a circle. And, you know, just as a quick reminder, the, the radius of a circle is the distance from the center to the circle itself. And it could give as its output the area of the circle. And this kind of function is typical of the functions we're going to study in the calculus in the sense that there's a formula for it. I mean, you can define a function, for example, that takes a person as its input and gives as its output the number of siblings they have. It's a perfectly nice function. You can't really study it with help. 
calculus, though, in terms of calculus, we want functions where the input and the output are related by a formula. As you might remember, the area of a circle formed of the is that the area is pi times the radius squared. So we talk about working with functions. Um, for intents and purposes, we're working with equations. Y equals something involving x would be sort of the, the, the classical variables. Y equals 2x squared minus 5x plus 7 or whatever. We put that for intents and purposes. The functions we study will be equations. And when I have that written on the board, probably the next question I would ask, well, maybe I'd be too shy to ask it, but the next question that would be bubbling up in my mind is, why are we insisting on this word then? If a function is just an equation, y equals the sine of x or y equals x squared or whatever, why are we even using the word function? Well, because functions have their own notation. And calculus, or at least the calculus that we're going to do in the first half of this class is going to be much easier to talk about if we're using function notation. And let me remind everyone what this function notation is. And we'll keep with the area example. The, uh, by the way, this, what I'm seeing, what you're seeing is typical, me standing on this end of side of the board, writing over here. So if I'm getting in your way, that's a problem that's probably not going to suddenly fix itself and you might consider shooting over to the other side of the room. Um, let's keep with the area of a circle. So we've got an input, the radius of the circle R. And we've got an output, the area of the circle, A. And the input and the output are related via a formula, which I wrote down that the area is pi times the radius squared. So function notation is just a slight variation on this. When you see it, you're probably going to wonder how it can be useful because it 
how it can be more useful, let's say, because it's so similar looking to what we already have on the board. So for function notation, We have to name this function. And the classical function name, mathematicians are not the most uh, creative sort always. The classical name of a function is f. It's short for function. But in an applied problem, we might give the function a more meaningful name. For example, this is an area function, so we might say, all right, let's call this function A. Function notation looks like this. The name of the function followed by the input in parentheses equals and then whatever formula you have. I said that for intents and purposes, we'll think of functions as always having formulas. So, Returning to this example, um, I sometimes use color for emphasis. I guess I should ask, is anybody here colorblind or is that going to be a problem for anyone? So here, the name of the function is A. The input, is the radius R, A parentheses R equals, and the formula is pi times the radius squared. Um, pi being a, a, a famous constant, 3.14 something. Um, when you're reading this aloud, so when I'm talking to you, or when you're asking questions to me, we don't say a parenthesis R, that could get a little annoying. We say A of R, or F of X or G of Y, or our name of variable. F of X equals X squared minus 2X plus 1. An unconnected function, just cut off the top of my head, but it's your variable is named x, your function is named f, f of x. And what this function notation is good for, um, it's good for many things, but one thing it's good for is compactly writing states of statement about inputs and outputs. I mean, let's say we don't have function notation. Let's say we just have y equal to something. Could somebody read that quadratic back to me? X squared. Plus 2x plus 1. 
I am in awe of your ability to do that without having it written down. And here's the same relationship written using function notations. So on the, we can think of what we have on the left and what we have on the right as expressing basically the same thing. On the left, we have a variable X and Y. On the right, we have an input and an output. So sort of, again, for intents and purposes, our input is X, our output is Y. These are expressing the same relationship using slightly different language. On the left, we can write a state. When x equals one, y equals four. That's when x is one, y is one squared plus two times one plus one, one plus two plus one equals four. Expressing the same thing with function notation. We write f of input equals output. f of one equals four. And we're doing the, the precise same thing on the left and the right. We're asking what happens when x equals one. So we're replacing every mention of x with one, and we're seeing what happens. And what happens is that f of one equals four. And as I have this written, it probably doesn't seem like a huge deal. I mean, what have I actually done? I've saved myself writing the word when, essentially. I mean, what I have here and what I have there are conveying the same information. What I have on the right is a little more compact. It's a little fewer brush strokes, but it's not that much more compact. It's not that much fewer brush strokes. Um, this is going to become really convenient, though, when we want our input to be something more complicated than a number, and when we want to have different inputs in the same expression. Here's something we can do using function notation. We can say that we want our input to be something a little more complicated than x. Maybe we want our input to be x plus a number. then we can mix and match. So here, our input is x plus h. Here, our input is x. And if this is seeming a little arcane, like what's he doing, we are going to spend 
many days talking about expressions that look just like this. If they're a little confused right now, it doesn't matter because they're, by the end of the class, you'll have had many, many opportunities to practice this. But trying to write this same thing using X's and Y's is really awkward. It's something like Y when instead of X. We have X plus H minus Y when, when X is X. It really just doesn't work to have expressions like this if they're not using function notation, or at least it's really awkward to do. And because calculus is so very interested in expressions that look like that, we really have to use function notation to use but to do account to this nicely. Yeah. Um, I mean, when calculus was first being discovered or invented, um, it was invented more or less simultaneously by two mathematicians, Newton, that's Isaac Newton of, of Newton's Laws of Motion fame, and a man named Leibniz. And they did not use function notation. And if you go back and you try to read, you know, their explanations, it's, it's a, an enormous headache. Um, so we'll be doing calculus with functions. So I did go on there, maybe sort of went on a slight tangent, but I guess that's okay. Does anybody have questions about function notation? So just to be very sure that we're on the same page, as far as things that look like this. Let's work through a quick example. Say f of x is, I don't know, something, a, a quadratic. So x is the input, what you have on the right is the output. If our input is one, our output is one. If our input is negative three, Our output is whatever this is. Nine plus negative three is six minus one is five. If our input is x plus h, our output is our input squared plus our input minus one. 
whether you have a number or whether you have a more complicated expression like x plus h, it's done exactly the same way. And, and this, you could simplify this, and it's not the most exciting thing, but in chapters 3.1 and 3.2, we are going to be simplifying a bunch of terms like this. So just for the record, what's x plus h squared? x squared plus 2x squared. Very close. You did not say x squared plus h squared, which I like. I sometimes see that, even in a calculus class. The middle term has an x in it, 2 times x times h. And if you struggle to do this in your head, that's perfectly fine. You can remember foiling. We multiply the first terms together and we get x squared. First outer. We multiply the outer terms together. and we get x times h. We multiply the inner terms together, and we get x times h. We multiply the last terms together, and we get h squared. And then, because we have two of those, You see, we have two xh's plus x plus h minus one. And it looks to me as if there aren't any like terms. That is, we can't combine anything on the board together. So there's our answer, simplified. And it's always funny when you do simplification and end up with something that looks much more complicated than, than you started out with. Like, is this really simpler? But we call this simplification by convention, whether it makes the expression simpler or not. So I won't well, uh, I won't do a bunch of examples like this now. As I say, we're going to be doing this a lot once we get to chapter three. It's not very fun. We might as well put it off as long as we can. Um, but again, does anybody have any questions about this? And I know I did promise that I wouldn't just stand up here and yap at you. Um, I would sort of like to get the chapter one review stuff done this week, if at all possible. So because of that, because we missed Monday, I mean, we didn't miss it, but we didn't lecture Monday. I am going through this a little faster than I would if we were teaching calculus um, instead of reviewing prerequisite stuff. Let me make an observation. We can graph functions. 
questions. I mean, if I guess I should come down a little, like if a function is, you know, taking a person as an input, giving the number of, a sib of siblings as an output, we of course couldn't really graph that. But the functions we're going to look at in this class are relationships where we've got equations. So, you know, y equals x squared, Y was the side of X. And since we can graph equations, I mean, we learn how to graph equations in algebra. I don't know what grade of high school or middle school even that would be, but since we can graph equations, and the functions we're studying are given by equations, it makes perfect sense that we can graph functions. And the way we do it, it doesn't require a lot of comment, I hope. Um, I mean, let's say we have an equation between x and y, y equals x squared. What's the word for this graph? Parabola is correct, thank you. We've got the x-axis and the y-axis. And we've got a graph that looks something like that. Now, suppose we were looking at a, the same equation. But instead of having y's and x's, we have x's and, well, f of x's. We have inputs and outputs. Nothing changes. I mean, by convention, you don't even change the name of this axis. You still call it the y-axis, even though you don't have any y's here. And the graph of the parabola is identical. So graphing functions is done just as you graph equations. You can think of this f of x as being a y and then graph that. In fact, I mean, I don't know if this needs the demonstration, but if we go, let's see. You're going to see this web page a lot because I'm going to want to do a lot of graphing and this is much, much nicer than using the virtual TI-84 to do graphing. This is desmos.com, an online graphing utility. It will generate y equals x squared for you just fine. It will also graph functions for you. And assuming that I enter them correctly, and you see it's just generating exactly the same graph in both cases. So, what is calculus? Or let's say what is differential calculus? But uh, 
everyone can see the red fine. I know the orange caused some problems, but what is calculus? Calculus is studying how functions and their brand. So, I mean, look at, look at this graph. Versus this graph. Um, I mean, pretty clearly there are different differences between these graphs. Um, and one of those differences is that if you think of the graph as a book that you will read from left to right, one of these graphs is going up and the other graph is going down, right? As you read the book from left to right, we go upwards, as we read the book from left to right, we go downwards. So even something as simple as this, is the graph going up? Is the graph going down? That can be phrased as a calculus problem. Is the derivative positive? Is the derivative negative? Never mind the details of what I just said, the word derivative and all of that. The point is that this is a calculus problem at heart. And I mean, a pretty, I won't say simple, because it's going to be weeks and weeks before we can answer it, but a relatively straightforward calculus problem. I would say, now consider a graph that looks like this, and a graph that looks like that. And make it clear that those are different graphs. Well, if you think of this again as a book, that you will read from left to right. Now these graphs are both going up. This graph is going up. This graph is going up. But again, there are differences between the graphs. Um, the graph on the left appears to be accelerating. It's going up kind of gradually at first, but then it gets steeper and steeper and goes up higher and higher. The graph on the right seems to be decelerating. It's initially going up pretty quickly, but then it flattens out and stops going up very fast. And again, asking, so how, how can we express this difference mathematically? I mean, I use the word accelerating and decelerating, but how can we mathematically tell what an equation is doing? Again, it's a calculus problem. And then you get graphs that look like this. You see graphs like that all the time. We'll look at a few applications in the class. And you say, OK, well, it looks like it's accelerating. And it's going up and up and up. 
And then at some point, something happens and it starts to decelerate. It starts to flatten out. Where does that happen? Where does this deceleration occur? Again, that's a calculus problem. And Isaac Newton, I mean, probably a lot of people know he invented calculus, but he's really famous, I think, because we all have to learn his laws of motion in high school. Or at least I, I did. I, I guess I don't know if everyone did. And I mean, Newton invented calculus as a tool to study emotion. So from that, his point of view, I mean, these words I'm using, accelerating, decelerating, they're very literal because he was thinking of physical objects accelerating, decelerating. But I mean, calculus has a lot of applications outside of physics. Like a lot of institutions make their business students take calculus, ours doesn't. But um, the reason you'd make a business student take calculus is that this graph yeah come on zoom you've been doing so nice and now this graph is the kind of graph you see when you're looking at adaption rates a new technology is put on the market, and initially it's kind of sluggish. No one quite knows what it is. So it's maybe expensive because the technology hasn't been perfected yet. So you get adapters, but kind of sluggish adapters. They go up slowly. And then you reach some kind of tipping point where it's like, okay, this newfangled smartphone thing is now cheap enough for people to access it. And it's easy enough to use that a lot of people want to access it. And adaption rates accelerate. And then at some point though, I mean, sort of the people who want to use the technology are using the technology. My twin brother will use a flip phone until the day he dies. There's nothing anyone can do about it. So adaption rates start to decelerate just because the market saturated is the way we would phrase that. And we get a graph that looks like this. And this is also the graph you get if you look at um, advertising, for example. If instead of adaption rates, you look at dollars spent on advertising and your y variable is the percentage of people who have heard of your product. Well, we see something very similar. You spend low amounts of money on advertising. It's not really doing much. 
rich. I mean, if I just say I'm going to take a hundred dollars and advertise Shadron State with it, what, what does that mean? What do I do with the hundred dollars? Probably not a whole lot in the practice. Eventually, though, as your advertising budget increases, you can start, you know, getting out television commercials or putting advertisements in airports to be, I, I'm not, I've never been convinced given some of the moods I've been in while I've been stuck in airports that that's a very good idea, but some people love to do it. Anyway, um, as you can really start to make use of the budget, we start getting a really meaningful effect. The percentage of people who are have seen our ads goes up. But again, at some point, there's a saturation effect. I mean, not everybody watches YouTube. You can spend $20 billion on YouTube ads, but we're never going to reach those people. So at some point, there's this point of diminishing returns where Throwing more money at the problem ceases to be really effective. And of course, people want to know, well, what are the points of diminishing returns of an advertisement campaign? Questions like that. So calculus gets used a lot in business, and that's when I'm coming up with applications, you're probably going to see a lot of that just because, well, I have friends in the business department and we talk and those are the applications I'm most aware of. But, you know, it, it shows up everywhere and I'll try to get at least a few applications from a variety of fields so that we can sort of see that. Anyway, um, we are not done with this section 1.1, but that's perfectly fine. Um, I said that I'd try not to keep you until a quarter after because my own brain is starting to fry by then. So, Fair is fair. Um, I will let you out now and I will see you all um, at a more reasonable hour. See you all nine o'clock, remember, tomorrow, same classroom.